Okay. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for our webinar with our speaker, Darren Scott with Keras. I'm Ashley Swingle, Marketing Specialist, also with Keras. And a few housekeeping items before we get started today. We are recording this meeting and everyone is kept in listen only mode. If you have questions, we encourage you to submit those throughout the presentation using the question pane in the GoToWebinar panel or email us directly. If you do submit questions through GoToWebinar, we will receive a report with the question and also your contact information to follow up directly after the webinar. If you're interested in receiving a PDF or recording of the presentation, please contact us. We encourage you to share the recording within your network. Here are a few ways to find us. We have listed our website and general sales and marketing email address, as well as my email address. Do you receive our email blasts for upcoming webinars, presentations, trade shows, and technical information on our various solutions? If not, sign up on our website. You can find the join our email list on any landing page on the right hand side. Be sure to select the industry when signing up to ensure you receive the most targeted information for your needs. And we can't forget to mention our social media platforms. We encourage you to connect with our Keras page as well as our team members on LinkedIn, where we are often sharing upcoming events, including webinars, industry articles or news, sharing relevant posts from other industry experts and more. And then listed here are links you can visit for upcoming web webinars and also our website. At this time, I would like to take the opportunity to introduce our speaker, Mr. Darren Scott. Darren has worked for Keras for over 20 years. As the technical marketing specialist, he conducts laboratory testing and product demonstration for Keras's municipal, industrial, and environmental customers and prospective new customers. These demonstrations include technical training, safety presentations, and installation of safe chemical handling and dosing systems. He is a graduate of Illinois Wesleyan University, Bloomington, Illinois, with a Bachelor of Science degree in Chemistry, ACS certified. Mr. Scott is a member of AWWA, Water Environment Federation, and the American Chemical Society. Good morning, everyone. We're gonna talk about a brief history of phosphates, the different types of phosphates, and then specifically get into sequestering phosphate applications. How you would go about selecting those phosphates, why are you using them for sequestering, and then some specific case studies about each of those products. Phosphates have been used in the drinking water market for a very, very long time, all the way back to 1887. In the 1930s, phosphates were used for a sequestering application called threshold treatment, where customers used sodium hexametaphosphate, SHEMP for short, in order to control calcium carbonate scale that could impact parts of their process. In the 1970s, we had zinc orthophosphates introduced for the treatment of low hardness and aggressive waters. And then in the 1990s, you saw the lead and copper rule be applied that set limitations on the amount of permissible lead and copper in drinking water. When we talk about phosphates and drinking water treatment, we're really talking about two main applications. We're talking about corrosion control, lead and copper, which has been in the news frequently in the last several years with the issues with Flint, Michigan, Newark, New Jersey, and many other customers having issues with lead service lines and high lead levels in the distribution system. The other aspect of phosphates that isn't talked about as frequently is sequestration, which is tying up of iron and manganese for color control, or tying up calcium carbonate for scale control. Now, when you look at applications for phosphates throughout the US, just over half of all water utilities in the US use some type of phosphate-based product for either corrosion control or sequestration. Now, AWARF has looked at this many times over the years, and there's roughly about 200 million spent annually on phosphate products by drinking water plants throughout the US. There are many benefits to feeding phosphate products. And one of the things they came up with was, although there was being $200 million spent annually on phosphate products, there was about a $4 billion in savings or a 20 fold return on investment. What that meant was they were spending money on phosphate products, but they had to do less stuff in the distribution system to respond to complaints. So less flushing of fire hydrants, less flushing of samples, 
uh, less water quality testing, they were able to protect that infrastructure and get longer life out of the distribution piping by feeding a phosphate product than they would without corrosion control. Now, phosphate products have a wide price range depending on what type of application that you're gonna use them for. But typically anywhere from one cents to 10 cents per thousand gallons of water treated is a typical treatment cost. Now, one of the questions that comes up when someone is new to using phosphates or they find out for the first time that phosphates are being used in drinking water treatment is a question about, well, they're a chemical, chemicals are bad for you. Well, phosphates are not bad for you. They're used in many of the things that we come in contact on a daily basis. They're used as a food additive. They're a leavening agent in donuts and bread. They're a dairy emulsifier in cheese that you eat. They're in the can of soda that you drink as phosphoric acid. They're also used as a pharmaceutical additive. They're in toothpaste as plaque inhibitors and whitening agents. So if you turn over a tube of toothpaste and read the ingredient list, you'll see different phosphate compounds. They're used as a nutrient for growth. So farmers apply them uh, to farm fields to grow uh, corn and beans. Over 80% of the global demand for phosphorus is actually for agriculture farming. It's also the same compound that you apply to your yard as well to grow the grass or grow the plants in your garden. Phosphates can also be used in different cleaners and detergents. They're good sequestering agents. They can remove stains, um, tie up other compounds. So there's a many, many uses of phosphates that we come in contact on a daily basis and even consume some of them. Phosphate classes are really separated into two distinct classes. And each has specifically some different properties. So we have orthophosphates, which contain one PO4 unit. And we have polyphosphate, which is also sometimes referred to as condensed phosphate, which is several PO4 units chained together. When we talk about orthophosphates, Orthophosphates contain one PO4 unit by themselves. Orthophosphates are what's typically written in the literature as doing corrosion control. So if you're feeding something for lead and copper control, it would typically be orthophosphate based or have a component of it that's orthophosphate based. Orthophosphates are anodic film formers. So they form films over the pipe out in the distribution system to provide that corrosion control. Polyphosphates can be as simple as two or more PO4 units chained together. These components act as a sequestering agent and as a cathodic inhibitor. Typically what we refer to for polyphosphates, straight chains are anywhere from two to three to four PO4 units in a straight chain. A specific type of polyphosphate called a metaphosphate is gonna contain a minimum of three or more PO4 units in a ring structure. But typically when we think of a ring structure, we think of five to 10 PO4 units in that ring structure, if it's considered a short chain metaphosphate. And if it's considered a long chain metaphosphate, it'll be somewhere between 10 and 20 PO4 units. Metaphosphates also do sequestering and also act as a cathodic inhibitor. The difference between a straight chain poly and a metaphosphate is how they act with sequestering in regards to iron, manganese, and total hardness in the distribution system. So when we talk about using a sequestering agent to improve finished water quality, we're really talking about the two applications at the top. We're talking about calcium carbonate scale inhibition, so to prevent the pipe from scaling up or preventing the hard water spots on your glasses or dishes when you wash them or we're trying to present iron and manganese from precipitating out. So you don't get the red water out of the fire hydrant or you don't get the specific color of brown from manganese coming out of the water tap. We wanna tie those things up into solution. Typically we talk about lead and copper corrosion control when we're talking about orthophosphates or orthopoly blended phosphates where we have an orthophosphate portion to provide a film. Typically what you'll hear is when someone's talking about using phosphates for corrosion control for lead and copper, they're in violation of the EPA action levels. For lead, that's 15 parts per billion. 
and for copper that's 1.3 milligrams per liter. When we talk about this application, we're typically talking about feeding an orthophosphate in a low hardness water, so under 50 milligrams per liter, and also having a low alkalinity as well. What you're using is the orthophosphate to form that film in that situation. If the water quality has a higher hardness, then scaling with calcium carbonate can be an issue, and you might switch to an orthopoly blend to have the poly to sequester the hardness. So since we're focused in on sequestration, uh, one of the main uses, like I said, was use of the phosphates for color control. When we talk about iron and manganese in a groundwater application, what we're really are talking about is if the iron and manganese in the groundwater is above the US EPA secondary maximum contaminant levels, then that water, when you chlorinate it and send it out to the distribution system, will turn colors based on the level of iron and manganese in the sample. The secondary maximum contaminant level for iron is 0.3 milligrams per liter, and for manganese, it's 0.05 milligrams per liter. What the US EPA says is these are secondary standards because they're not health effects, or at least they're not listed as health effects currently, and that they're really gonna cause staining of laundry and fixtures. They're gonna cause discolored water in the distribution system. So you're gonna generate a lot of customer complaints just because the water looks discolored. There's not a negative health effect um, from water uh, having levels above those. Typically where you see sequestering of iron and manganese is in a groundwater where they're using it in place of oxidation. They don't have the space or the money to build a complete treatment plant to take the water out of the ground and to remove the iron and manganese. So they sequester it with a polyphosphate to keep it in solution so that it doesn't color when it gets sent to the distribution system. The other major application for sequestration is for scale control. Anytime you have a high total hardness, with, which includes calcium carbonate, you can have scaling that can happen both in the treatment plant. In some situations, you can have your filters uh, calcify over with solids, which impacts how well you can filter the water. You can then also have the calcium carbonate scale up the distribution piping, which will restrict flow. And then the end use customer can see that calcium carbonate scaling on the equipment, like you can see in the picture with the water fountain with a distinctive white calcium carbonate ring from where the water sat. Typically when you get above 100 hardness and you get closer to 300 to 400, calcium carbonate scaling can, can be an issue for the distribution system. Now, when we talk about polyphosphate sequestering, we're really talking about those three different applications. So iron, manganese, and calcium carbonate. And each of them acts slightly differently. It's a bonding of the polyphosphate to the metal and tying it up so that it can no longer be oxidized by either air in the water or by chlorine, which is also used as a disinfectant. In the case of iron, like I said earlier, the secondary maximum contaminant level is 0.3 milligrams per liter. Above that level, if you were to send the iron out to the system without any sequestering agent, in combination with your chlorination, it's gonna cause discolored water. You'll see a bathtub with distinctive iron staining. You may see fire hydrants that flush a lot of red water. Typically, you get that distinctive rusty orange water from the iron. Kind of a rule of thumb that we use at Keras is if you're trying to sequester iron, you can sequester iron up to about three milligrams per liter. Once you get above three milligrams per liter of iron, typically your better option is gonna be oxidation and filtration to remove the iron from the system. Now, one of the things you may hear is there are 10 state standards for water quality. The 10 state standards references that you can sequester up to about one part of combined iron and manganese. Now that's just a standard saying that, hey, if you're above one milligrams per liter, we think it would be better to do oxidation and filtration. It's not a hard and fast rule, which is why we say at Keras from experience of feeding phosphate products for many years, that about three milligrams per liter of iron is something that you can really reasonably sequester out in the system. Now we talk about sequestering for iron and manganese that we can sequester um, one milligram per liter of iron and manganese 
with one to two milligrams per liter of polyphosphate. This will result in clear water and no staining on fixtures out in the distribution system. When we talk about manganese, manganese SMCL is much lower, 0.05 milligrams per liter. Water will be brown to black depending on the concentration and you will have definite staining on laundry and fixtures. The rule of thumb here is much less. We talk about only sequestering really up to about half a milligram per liter of manganese. If you get above that level, it's very hard to keep it sequestered and you will tend to have colored water issues in the distribution system. The same rule of thumb applies here. We need roughly one to two milligrams per liter of polyphosphate per one milligram per liter of manganese that you're trying to sequester. One of the other applications that we can talk about is calcium carbonate. But one of the things you wanna look at for color control issues is out in the distribution system when you're flushing a fire hydrant. One of the things to keep track of when you're flushing a fire hydrant is how long does it take for the water to flush clear when you're flushing that fire hydrant. Ideally within the first uh, 10, 15, 30 seconds that fire hydrant water should clear up and be relatively clean coming out of the fire hydrant like you see in the right hand picture. Tying up iron and manganese can prevent staining in a lot of different applications. One of the uses that you will see is in irrigation for the use of a polyphosphate. And they'll use it for two main applications. Um, if you have an irrigation system in your lawn, um, or if you're a large scale producer, um, it can plug uh, the drip and spray irrigation nozzle. So you won't get water coming out of those nozzles um, and you'll have to take those nozzles off and clean them. The other main application for a homeowner would be staining of the concrete, which you can see in the right hand picture, they had iron in the water and you can see the distinctive staining of the concrete brick uh, with the iron after the water came in contact with it. So you can sequester to prevent that. The same thing applies in a home with a pool um, or a wave park or a waterfall. What you're really trying to prevent are those two things. Prevent the iron staining like you can see in the middle picture where they've got the distinctive brown discoloration on the tile. Or we'll talk about it here shortly, calcium carbonate scaling where you can see the distinctive white scale and the white ring around the pool in the far right picture. Wave pools will do the same thing because they don't like to see that discoloration and that calcium carbonate uh, scaling as well in those situations. Finally, another uh, application for sequestration would be animal feed uses for polyphosphate. In this case, uh, feeding goats, cows, chickens, horses, um, especially if they have a large scale application with many places for the chickens or cows to drink the water, you wanna prevent the plugging of the water nozzle or plugging of the water line going to that nozzle so the animal can get sufficient water. So feeding a polyphosphate in this application keeps those lines clean, keeps the water flowing so that the animal can get as much water as it needs. When we talk about polyphosphate sequestering of total hardness, what we're really talking about is not really true sequestering, we're talking about threshold treatment. What that means is we don't need as much polyphosphate to sequester the calcium carbonate. What we really need to do is have enough polyphosphate in solution to just get in the way of those ion pairs to prevent the calcium carbonate from clustering together and forming a crystal and dropping out of solution. Kind of a rule of thumb we use at Keras is we can sequester 100, 500, uh, milligrams per liter of hardness. So you can sequester a very high hardness water and prevent that scaling. And it doesn't take a lot of polyphosphate to do that threshold treatment. We talk about needing only about one to two milligrams per liter of polyphosphate per every 342 milligrams per liter of total hardness that you have. The result is you don't have the scaling or plugging in the distribution system. You don't see those white rings in water fountains or on dishes. Uh, out there in the distribution system. So you can see it's a much lower dosage of polyphosphate per milligram per liter of total hardness. Depending on the type of treatment plant you have, 
is we have several customers that are using lime softening. The lime softening process uses a lime slurry to raise the pH up of the water and uh, raise up the total hardness. And then you'll crash out the excessive hardness because the pH gets high enough. At that point, you can then send the water out the door at a much lower uh, hardness. So if you had a 300 or 400 hardness after a lime softening process, you might send water out somewhere around 100 milligrams per liter. Well, there's a couple different places in a lime softening plant that they have issues with scaling. Feeding that lime slurry to the application point, the lime can plug those feed lines. So you can feed a polyphosphate into the lime slurry itself. And that helps to keep some of the lime slurry suspended so it's much easier to pump it to your application point. Also, after doing the lime softening process and doing the recarbonation at the back of the plant to adjust the pH down, sometimes plants will have issues with calcification and calcium scaling on their filters. So some plants with lime softening will feed a small amount of polyphosphate on top of the filters to prevent that calcification of the filters and allow the filters to operate properly. Then also after filtration, some lime softening plants will also continue to feed a polyphosphate to prevent that water from scaling up the piping as it goes to the clear well and then out to the distribution system. So in the case of a lime softening plant, you can see the polyphosphate used in a couple different application points. Some plants will use it in all three. Some will only use it where they have the specific issue that they're trying to deal with. Another use of polyphosphates is in restaurants for their soda machines and their ice machines. If they have a high hardness water that's coming into the restaurant, that calcium scaling can plug up the little moving parts in the soda fountains. It can plug up the filters for the water going to the soda machine as well. And it also can plug up uh, contactors in the ice machine as well. So what you're using it typically in that type of application in a restaurant or ice machine you're using it specifically to tie up the calcium carbonate so that it doesn't plug up all those small moving parts and filters in that application. For this type of application, it's usually fed from a cartridge and it's attached to the line going directly to the ice machine or the soda machine. And that's the only water that they treat um, is the water going to those applications. Depending on where you're at in the US, depends on how much total hardness that you have. This map shows what surface water looks like. And depending on if you're on the East Coast or West Coast, you'll typically have a very soft surface water. In the Midwest, because the Great Lakes are sitting on limestone, our hardness in surface waters tend to be around 100 to 150 hardness. And you'll see that somewhere out in the Southwest as well. Now this map is showing surface water water quality. If you switch to groundwater, it's really going to be based on the aquifer that you're pulling the water from and what the hardness is in that aquifer. Depending on how deep the well is can also determine how much hardness that you can have in the well as, as well. So one of the first things when you're de determining what you're going to do is get that water quality and what the total hardness is from that groundwater source to determine if you're going to have issues with scaling. One of the things that we don't think about a lot with calcium carbonate scaling is that as that pipe gets impacted, as you reduce the diameter of the pipe, the electrical cost increases to pump that water through the pipe. One of the other things that happens is you'll also have a more back pressure on your pump, which can require you to do more maintenance on that pump because it's trying to force the same amount of water through a restricted pipe. One of the things that we always kind of forget about is the reason why a distribution system is built with the size diameter pipes it has is because they're looking at future growth and how many consumers are gonna pull water off of those pipes. As we restrict that pipe, whether it be with calcium carbonate scale or with iron and manganese deposits, as that pipe gets restricted, that's gonna cost you more to pump water out to the distribution system. So one of the things we wanna do is to avoid having all that scale and tuberculation out there in the system because it'll decrease our energy cost. In the picture you see, if the pipe went from 20 to 12, the same amount of water being pumped through the pipe would increase the electrical costs tenfold. So a pretty significant impact to pumping costs.
One of the other uses of polyphosphates is on biofilm removal. A 1990 study was looking at the disinfection ability of both free chlorine and monochloramine, which was being used for controlling biofilms out in your distribution system. What they also looked at was what kind of corrosion control treatment options would do to that application out in the distribution system as well. They determined that if you applied a corrosion inhibitor that had a polyphosphate in it, that it improved the disinfection efficiency of free chlorine and chloramines. That polyphosphate application showed in that data that they could get a decrease in biofilm counts. What we know from that study and from other studies is that if you feed a polyphosphate, it can disrupt the biofilm itself. It interacts with both the scale and the biofilm surface itself and basically punches holes in the biofilm and the scale itself. What that does is allow the chlorine to get farther into the biofilm and disinfect and help to slowly remove it. The results consistently showed a decrease in bacteria and the chlorine residuals were much improved after that biofilm was removed and that scale was removed from the distribution system. One thing to keep in mind, when you're doing this type of biofilm removal, you're gonna exert a chlorine demand because as you break the biofilm up, that means more chlorine or monochloramine is gonna interact with it to disinfect it. So you may see a chlorine residual drop. What that means is you may need to turn the chlorine residual up slightly during this process and then turn it back down once the residuals rebound and become higher after the biofilms removed. We get asked a lot of questions at Keras about this application where phosphorus is a nutrient for biofilm removal. Well, that's true. Phosphorus can be a nutrient for biofilms, but that's in the absence of chlorine or monochloramine. When you're feeding a disinfectant, that's going to kill the biofilm and then it no longer becomes a food source because you have proper disinfection in the system. So when you're doing biofilm renewal, you need to make sure that you maintain your chloramine or monochloramine residual so that you have proper disinfection to get rid of that biofilm from the distribution system. One of the questions that gets asked is how does this biofilm removal ask? Well, one of the things that happens is both the scale and biofilm that's out there in the distribution system has metals trapped in it. The polyphosphate can come in and the PO4 minus, grab onto that positive metal ion, and it sequesters it or pulls it out of the biofilm or scale and pulls it into solution. What that does is punch a hole in the biofilm and that allows chlorine or monochloramine to come into the biofilm and start to disinfect it or help slowly remove the scale. Over time, along with flushing, you'll see that biofilm go away or that scale start to slowly be removed. Now, one of the questions that comes up, can you do this quickly and not have any detrimental effects? Well, in a full scale distribution system, you really wanna do this slowly so that you don't have any issues with discolored water or with consistent loss of chlorine residual. So slow and steady wins the race in the distribution system. Where we do this quickly is if someone's doing a well cleaning. So they have a groundwater well, that has iron bacteria or has a lot of heavy scaling, and they've seen a lot of reduced flows coming out of the well itself. In that case, they can feed a really high dosage of polyphosphate to really break up this biofilm and scale, and then feed a high chlorine dose, super chlorinate it to, to, to remove all that biofilm, and then flush it to waste before they put the well back into service. So it's really a matter of your application. In well cleaning, you can do a very quick treatment to get it back in service within a day. In the distribution system, we're really talking about a very long period, six months, years, to try to remove that biofilm and scale with proper dosage and disinfectant. Now, there's been a lot of research done on polyphosphates. We know that the polyphosphate, depending on the type that you're feeding, is how much metals it can sequester and what the water chemistry is. Depending on what the pH of the water is, are you feeding free chlorine or monochloramine? What are the iron and manganese levels that you have? Those all determine how much polyphosphate that you need to feed to the situation. We know research shows that if you feed a polyphosphate specifically for iron, it's very good at reducing the amount of color and turbidity that you would have from iron issues in the distribution system. 
We also know that all polyphosphates revert to orthophosphate over time. It's a process called hydrolyzation. The polyphosphates revert to ortho, the chain breaks down, and you'll see an increase in orthophosphate in the system. This process is time sensitive, which means the longer the polyphosphate sits in the water, the more of it will break down over time and you'll lose some of your sequestering ability. What that means from a consumer standpoint are there are two shelf lives that you need to kind of keep in mind. Buying the neat polyphosphate from us typically means you have a shelf life of six months to one year for using that polyphosphate based product that you're bringing into your plant because you're going to lose some polyphosphate in the concentrated form to orthophosphate. Also, once you feed the polyphosphate to the distribution system, because you're feeding at such a low dosage of say one or two or three milligrams per liter as phosphate, that reversion rate speeds up. So as that water moves through the distribution system, if it takes you five days, seven days, 10 days for water to get from the treatment plant through the far points of the distribution system, you'll typically see that poly breakdown and you might see 10%, 20%, even 30 or 40 percent increase in ortho as you get to that really long water age as the poly reverts back to ortho. So those two things to keep in mind when storing a polyphosphate. How long are you going to store the neat product? And then once you dose it in the system, how long does it take for all that water to transport through the distribution system? Regardless of who you buy polyphosphates from, they all revert to orthophosphate over time. That part is part of the science. When we talk about polyphosphate dosing, we talk about dosing as total phosphate because there's no direct way to measure polyphosphate itself. We can measure orthophosphate, we can measure a total phosphate, and the difference between those two is gonna be the polyphosphate that you're feeding to the system. Your dose is really gonna be dependent on how much iron and manganese and hardness you have in the water. If you're sequestering iron and manganese, that rule of thumb of one to two parts of poly per part of iron and manganese means you'll probably be on the higher dosage side. If you're sequestering total hardness, one to two parts for every 340 parts of hardness means your dosage probably will tend to be on the lower side. One of the things you may have to tweak is your dosage based on your water age. If your water moves through the distribution system and gets through the, the long water age, in less than three to five days, then you'll tend to have a lower dosage toward that one milligram per liter ratio. If the water sits in the distribution system for seven days, 10 days, or even longer, then you might have to increase your polyphosphate dosage to compensate for the loss of poly to ortho over time. So just some kind of rules of thumb to keep in mind. In the 1990s, polyortho blended phosphates became very, very popular because you had multiple applications that the customer needed to get in compliance with. They needed to comply with the new lead and copper rule for corrosion control. And they also were feeding a polyphosphate, whether it be for iron and manganese sequestration or for calcium carbonate scale control. So feeding a polyortho blend can help you do both of those in one product. Dosing for a polyortho blend typically will have a range. You can have anywhere from half a part to two milligrams per liter as orthophosphate. And then depending on the blend ratio, anywhere from a half a part to four milligrams per liter or higher is total. And the difference between those numbers would be the poly. Your dose is really gonna be dependent on the water quality that we talked about. So we really wanna measure the iron, manganese and hardness going out the door. And your blend ratio can change depending on what your treatment goal is. If you need to do some sequestering, but you're really struggling with lead and copper numbers, well, then you might have a really high orthophosphate content and only feed a little bit of the polyphosphate for sequestering. So you might have a ratio where it's 70% ortho and only 30% poly. If you really have a lot of iron and manganese to sequester, then you might have two or three parts as polyphosphate and only have one part as orthophosphate if your lead is, is in compliance. So that ratio is gonna be determined on what you have to sequester. Our first case study here was a system that had very heavy tuberculation out in the system, as you can see in the before picture of the distribution piping. 
they had reduced flows through the fire hydrants out in the distribution system. They were getting periodic red water complaints and they were exceeding the copper action level of 1.3 milligrams per liter out in the distribution system. Plan operation was groundwater. They went through a lime softening process. They had sand filtration and they treated about 1.3 MGD on a daily basis. Finished water quality at a pH of about 7.3. The hardness after lime softening going out the door was 125 milligrams per liter. Manganese 0.01, so almost no manganese. A little bit of iron was still making it through the lime softening process. And the alkalinity going out the door was 100 milligrams per liter. The treatment they chose was they chose 1.3 milligrams per liter as total phosphate, 0.4 milligrams per liter as ortho. So they were feeding a 70-30 blended phosphate, in this case, our Aquamade product. After treating with this product, they noticed that there was a 35% average reduction in copper. So they dropped below 1.3 milligrams per liter to 0.98 milligrams per liter for copper on first draws. The reduction in lead levels was 29%. While they were already in compliance with lead, the number dropped further down to 6.3 parts per billion. They noticed that they had reduced red water complaints in the system with the product they chose. After feeding the product over the course of a year, they noticed that their chlorine demand decreased 37%. So they were able to feed less chlorine and still maintain the same chlorine residual in the distribution system. After one year, they went out and tested fire hydrants and noticed that the average flow improvement was 65% in impacted fire hydrants. So they had a distinctive increase in flow. Also, filter backwash frequency decreased five times. They were feeding the product prior to filtration and they weren't getting as much calcification on the filters. And their electrical pumping cost, because they were getting that flow improvement in the system, their cost decreased 12% to pump the same amount of water out the door. So many, many benefits from feeding this product. After one year of treatment with this product and flushing uh, unidirectionally from the plant multiple times during the course of the year, you can see they were able to remove a lot of scale and tuberculation from the piping out in the distribution system, which is what, what showed them all these great benefits in the system. Our second case study is a plant that was feeding a 90 poly 10 ortho blended phosphate. They had been using a 50 poly 50 ortho blend. And even with that blend, they were still getting 10 to 15 colored water complaints per month. They had long hydrant flushing times of greater than 30 minutes. And they had scale formation on their pack tower aeration media that they were using to remove VOCs. They had to clean this media quarterly with acid to remove the scaling. Plant operation was a groundwater uh, with seven different wells. Two wells were actually pumped directly to the system. The other five wells went through a treatment system. And they had 3.8 MGD of water they treated on a daily basis. Depending on the well, uh, they could have varying water quality. pH typically was in the 7.3 to 7.5 range, but iron could vary anywhere from a tenth to 0.25 milligrams per liter. Manganese was always low in the wells from 0.01 to 0.03, and the hardness could vary from 340 to 490 milligrams per liter, depending on which well they were using. Changing from the 50-50 blend to the 90 poly 10 ortho blend, they chose to feed 1.5 milligrams per liter as total phosphate, which would give them about 0.15 milligrams per liter as ortho. So the majority of this product was polyphosphate. The reason they picked the 90-10 blend was they wanted to be able to track orthophosphate, which is a relatively easy test that we'll show here in a few slides. So it was a way for them to monitor what was going on in the system without having to do the longer total phosphate test, which requires a digestion. Within five days of changing from the 50-50 blend to the 90-10 blend, they were able to observe that they had less color complaints in the system and less staining on plumbing. That first month, they only got two customer complaints from colored water. 
and over 120 complaints in the first year got reduced to seven over the course of the next year with this treatment. Hydrant flushing time in the system went from over 30 minutes to less than five. And the acid cleaning of the PAC tower aeration was do done quarterly prior to this treatment change was now down to only having to do it once per year to keep the tower clean and operating efficiently. So some direct benefits from switching to a higher poly blend in this situation based on the water quality. One of the questions we get asked is where would you inject a phosphate? Typically, we want to inject the phosphate solution using a corporation stop in the main prior to chlorination. The reason for this is we need to tie up the iron and manganese with the polyphosphate prior to adding the chlorine because chlorine will oxidize the iron and manganese. Once the iron and manganese precipitate out of solution, you can no longer sequester them and put them back into solution. We also kind of have a rule of thumb of where we would apply these in the treatment plant. Um, if you have a static mixer, then you can apply the polyphosphate or the blended polyortho, have the static mixer, and then apply your chlorination directly after the static mixer because you've got the static mixer. If you don't have that kind of application, ideally you would love to have the polyphosphate prior to an elbow in the line so that you get the turbulence to mix the polyphosphate in as the water goes through the elbow and goes to the other section of pipe. Or if you have to put both of them in the same piece of straight pipe, ideally for every one inch diameter of the pipe that we're injecting into, we would like to have one foot of distance between those application points. So if you've got a six inch line that you're injecting into, ideally we'd like to have six inches between the polyphosphate injection point and the bleach injection point with the bleach injection point downstream always. If you're looking at total hardness scaling, then you typically might apply it before your filters if you're getting calcification of your filters because you want to prevent that. If you're not seeing any scaling issues on your filters, then you'll typically apply it after filtration going into your clear well. At this point with total hardness scaling, your chlorine injection points usually not an issue because your chlorine's not oxidizing any iron and manganese because you're, you're looking at total hardness scaling. So in that situation, if the chlorine goes in prior to the polyphosphate, it typically doesn't interfere uh, in hardness sequestering. Now, the one place where this can make a difference is we do have some groundwater plants that have very high hardness water and they're feeding sodium hypochlorite into the feed line for the chlorination point. Because of the high concentration of total hardness and then feeding the high pH bleach to that application point, sometimes they'll get calcium carbonate scaling locally at that injection point. So feeding the polyphosphate upstream of that bleach injection point can help prevent that calcium carbonate crash out at that injection point. So in that situation, if it's because you're getting scaling at the injection of the bleach, then you do wanna feed the polyphosphate upstream of it to help prevent that as an issue. Now you can feed the polyphosphate either neat, which is typical, either directly out of the container or out of a day tank. You can also dilute the product if you need to, or feed it with carry water if you've got a long run to your application point. You can use a wide variety of pumps for phosphate injection, whether it be peristaltic or membrane pumps. Typically, most customers will either flow pace the pump or SCADA control it. You wanna make sure you're feeding the phosphate to the amount of water that you're treating um, to tie that levels together so you have the proper amount in the, in, the, in the system after feeding. So one of the things that kind of gets asked a lot is we always talk about this injectant first, um, and it's just a good idea. Even in the case of hardness scaling, there's no drawback to feeding the phosphate first for, for sequestra sequestration, even if it is an iron and manganese. So you'll see this in a lot of our presentation literature that talks about feeding it first. But if you have a question on this, it's something you can always call. We can walk through the application and see what makes the most sense for your application. Now, one of the first things that'll get asked by me when I talk to a customer is if you're feeding a phosphate product and it's not working correctly or we're not getting the results we expected, um, there's some things we want to look at. 
So typically when we're feeding a phosphate, we wanna have a calibration of the metering pump that's applying it in mils per minute or gallons per hour that it's supplying to the system. If you had a weigh scale or a level indicator on the day tank or drum, that really tells us how much product you're feeding. And then based on how much water you're treated, we can calculate what the dosage is supposed to be for your water quality. And then we can match that to what our theoretical dosage was supposed to be to make sure that you're feeding the right amount to make sure we're getting both corrosion control and sequestration. So how do you go about monitoring a phosphate product? Well, like I said earlier, one of the easier ways to measure phosphate products is to measure orthophosphates, which won't measure polyphosphate in solution. The reason people use orthophosphate to measure uh, phosphate in the, in the system is that you add the powder pillow, you mix the sample, and two minutes later, the solution turns blue. The darker the blue, the higher the orthophosphate content. So like you saw in our case study, they were feeding a product that was 90% poly and 10% ortho because they could use that ortho portion to measure what they were seeing in the system. And then they could occasionally run a total phosphate test to verify that the total phosphate was at the right level as well. But the ortho was a quick and easy test to make sure that they were feeding and everything was going right on a daily basis. Well, you ask, why wouldn't you run a total phosphate test on a daily basis? Well, the total phosphate test needs to be run in the lab. The test requires a heated acid per sulfate digestion. So typical method that you see people do is 30 minutes at 150 degrees C, and it's in a test and tube. So it's in a sealed tube, and that's to break the polyphosphate down into ortho. You then measure the orthophosphate content after you do this digestion. And the difference between the total number and an ortho that you read before the digestion will tell you how much polyphosphates in this in the sample because this takes 30 minutes and the heat block not all systems run the poly test they may send this out to a certified lab they may send it to us to do a test on an occasional business but that's why you do the ortho test versus the total test the total test just takes more equipment and more time One of the things to keep in mind when you're measuring a phosphate product is you'd like to test at the treatment plant. So right after you've dosed the product to make sure you're seeing the correct ratio of poly to ortho. You then would like to test out in the distribution system, maybe at the midpoint and then at some of the dead end lines. And what your goal is gonna be is you should have results near the target level throughout the distribution system. So if your target is two parts as total phosphate in the system, then hopefully as you've been dosing over the course of many months, you'll see two parts at the midpoints and at the dead end lines out in the distribution system. Now measuring ortho and total numbers at the far points can tell you how much reversion you're seeing. So you can see the ortho come up at the dead end lines and the total phosphate number go, uh, the polyphosphate number go down, which means you're losing some sequestering ability. That may tell us that we may need to feed a little bit more at the plant to get more poly out to the system. You can also follow this up with some iron and manganese tests to look at, are we seeing iron and manganese drop out in the system because we've lost sequestering and so it's crashed out and you might see some colored water complaints in the system because we've lost sequestering as well. So there's a lot of different tests when you're feeding a poly ortho blend or a straight poly in the system where you can see what's going on in the distribution system. So how do you go about choosing a phosphate? What we really want is the water quality leaving the plant, and then what's the water quality in the distribution system at all those different points, so midpoint, dead end lines. Specifically then, what types of problems are you having in the distribution system? Are you having lead and copper issues along with discolored water? Are you having just scaling issues in the system and no lead and copper issues? And then ideally, what are your treatment goals? Do you want to treat everything that you're having issues with? Are you going to use different treatments for different applications? Um, maybe you're going to do something for iron and manganese removal at the plant. So you're really looking long term at just sequestering of hardness. Or you're looking at just lead and copper control because you're going to do oxidation and infiltration in the plant. So what are your treatment goals?
So what we typically look at, um, we'll send out sample bottles uh, with a chain of custody to you, and we'll collect the water sample and you can send it back to us. We'll test for total hardness. We'll also look at alkalinity. We'll look at your soluble iron and manganese after filtration. So we typically want, if you have filtration, a sample at your plant right after filtration. And that's to determine how much iron and manganese is going out the door that we need to sequester. We'll also measure orthophosphate because some groundwater plants will have background ortho. Um, and so our dosage will be on top of that background. Some wells can have as much as half a part or one milligram per liter of background orthophosphate. And so when we establish a dosage of say one part of poly, we really need that to be one part plus the background ortho. So if you had a half a part in the background, you really want 1.5 parts of total in the system to make sure you have that one part of poly out there. Ideally pH, we can be between pH six and nine. Optimal is between seven and eight. One of the things to keep in mind is you raise the pH of the water, higher pHs tend to help iron and manganese precipitate out of solution. So if you have a higher pH and you're sequestering, you're fighting against that pH wanting the iron and manganese to precipitate out of solution. So ideally for iron and manganese, we wanna be in that seven to eight range to get the best sequestering ability. Same thing with calcium carbonate. As you raise the pH up, calcium carbonate wants to precipitate out as a scale. So you're fighting against that if you have a higher pH as well. So what does that look like? If you don't have any iron and manganese or any hardness to sequester in the situation, and you're really only looking for lead and copper control in that type of application, then you're typically going to feed a straight orthophosphate and you're looking for no sequestration. That would be a Keras 3000 or Keras 4000 series product. If you have a lot of sequestering that you need to do, um, high hardness, high iron and manganese, maybe you're doing air stripping or you're doing irrigation or you're going to do something like a well cleaning project, well, then you're really looking at that polyphosphate to keep everything sequestered in solution or using that polyphosphate to break up the scale. In that case, you'll be using something in the Keras 1000 series. If you have some lead and copper issues along with some needs for sequestration, then you're typically gonna use a product that's in the Aquameg series, the CalSequest series, the Aquadine series, or the Keras 8000 series. All those products will have different ratios of poly to orthophosphate, and that ratio can change based on your water quality. So if you have a lot of sequestering, then maybe you'll be on a 70 poly or a 90 poly ratio product with less ortho. But if you only have a little bit of sequestering to do, so say you only have 150 or 200 hardness, then maybe you'll be on a product that's 30% poly and 70% ortho. So you're really focused on the corrosion control side. We can pick one of our many different products, over 75 that we have, to meet your specific water quality goals and needs in the distribution system by picking the right product and the right dosage for your water quality. To get into a little bit of the math here at the end, what we're gonna do with that water quality that we get from you or from the testing that we do if you send samples into our lab is we're gonna determine a range of how much polyphosphate that we need to feed. In this case, we have a water where we're talking about say 300 hardness, one milligram per liter of iron and pretty much no manganese sequester. If you walk it through the equation that you see above, hardness divided by 342 and iron and manganese added together, you can see the low end of the range where we would need about 1.9 milligrams per liter as polyphosphate on the low side. If we think we're gonna have a longer water age or we're still having color issues at that low dosage, then we may up it to uh, every 171 parts of hardness or your iron and manganese times two, which would say on the high side, we would see about 3.8 milligrams per liter as polyphosphate. So you can see there's a range there. Typically when we start an application, we're always gonna start at the lower end and then slowly work our way up if we're still experiencing some water quality issues out there in the distribution system. To walk through this calculation with one of our specific products called Keras 1100, it's a 100% polyphosphate based product and it has a total phosphate content of 36%. 
So you can see that if we needed 1.9 parts as polyphosphate, you can walk through the math and determine that you need about 5.25 milligrams per liter as product, which then can tell us how many pounds of Keras 1100 you need per million gallons of water treated. And then we can also then further convert that to how many gallons of product per 1 million gallons of water you need. This is something that you can walk through with your regional sales representation or myself in technical marketing to determine what product we're going to feed and then how many pounds and gallons per day based on your water flow are we going to need to feed so we can get you the proper information for the dosage you're going to feed to the system. Also, if you then choose a different product that has a blended ratio, so in this case, Keras 8100, which is 70 poly 30 ortho, you can see the math gets slightly more complicated because we have to add the blend ratio in, in addition to the total phosphate content. What that shows is we still need that same 1.9 milligrams per liter as polyphosphate, but because our product's now only 70% active um, as polyphosphate, that dosage as product goes up from five parts to seven parts. Our poundage goes up to 65 pounds and our usage goes up to 5.5 gallons. So depending on the product you pick, it's gonna determine how much you feed to get that required amount of polyphosphate out there in the system. And we can change that blend ratio if there's other requirements that you need in the system. When you feed a blended phosphate, because you're gonna have poly and ortho, we can then determine the orthophosphate dosage that you have in the system. So you can see the math here below. And then that could be what your target would be to measure in the distribution system. Cause you can use that quick hock powder pillow uh, in two minutes and get an ortho reading. In this case, we can see with this blend ratio, we need about 0.8 as ortho. So that could be something that you could measure easily in the system. With that customer in the case study earlier where they were on a 90-10 blend, they were only really measuring 0.15 as ortho, but that was enough to know that they had ortho in the system, which meant they had the proper polyphosphate in the system. So we can show you both how much total, how much poly, and then what the ortho is, which is the easier test to measure in the system. And we can walk you and your engineer through all these tests and all this math to determine what the product is going to be fed and what the dosages are in the system. Now, I always like to finish uh, a presentation with what type of PPE. So typically when we talk about feeding a polyphosphate product or a polyortho blend, the pH of these products is typically neutral. So you can wear safety glasses or goggles when you're handling them or rubber or appropriate polymer gloves when handling these products. These products are not DOT hazardous for shipping. So if you needed to move product from one well house to another, because they're not hazardous for shipping, you could put the drum or some of that product into your uh, company truck and move it to the other well house and apply it there if you get, ran short somewhere. You don't need to worry about the hazard for shipping because these products are neutral. And you can see there's not a lot of PPE required when handling these products either. So in summary, Phosphate's extent use is pretty extensive across the U.S. Very small groundwater systems to very large surface water systems will use phosphates for both corrosion control and sequestration. Ideally, the benefits for feeding a phosphate are worth the cost. If you're feeding for corrosion control, that's getting into lead and copper compliance. But in the case of sequestering, we want clean water that looks clear and is not discolored, not causing staining on laundry and fixtures for the customer. Reduce the scaling out in the distribution system so you don't have customers complaining of hard water spots and scaling uh, in their sinks and faucets. Reduced flushing times. Every gallon of water that you flush is a gallon of water that you've paid to treat at the plant that you're not recouping the cost because you're flushing it to waste. And also, if you have a lot of scale and tuberculation in the system, that can increase your disinfectant demand. So you'll actually feed more chlorine or chloramines to maintain your residual. So if you can clean up the distribution system, tie up those metals and calcium, you'll be able to feed lower chlorine to still maintain those residuals in the system. Overall though, feeding a phosphate product leads to overall better water quality to the customer.
And with that, there's the contact information for each of our individual regional sales reps and for our territories. Perfect, thank you, Darren. At this time, we will go ahead and start taking questions. Uh, Darren, as Darren said, um, on the slide now shows our regional sales managers with their contact information. Feel free to reach out in your re feel free to reach out to yours in your region. We did have a couple questions come in, Darren. Um, the first one is, when the iron and manganese are sequestered, do they show up on lab tests? Thanks, Ashley. So that question comes up a lot, and it's really based on what test you're running. So if you're running it with a powder pillow test, so using color reagents like powder pillows to color uh, uh, and determine the iron and manganese, um, the polyphosphate sequestering of iron and manganese will prevent that powder pillow from actually turning colors. So what that looks like in a Hawk powder pillow test is that it looks like the iron and manganese disappeared. It's not there anymore. Um, and what's really happening is it's just sequestered. If you take that same water sample and send it to a certified lab, most certified labs will run iron and manganese by AA or ICP, which means they burn the sample off. The iron and manganese will show back up because that method is actually measuring what's physically there, that not even the stuff that's sequestered, and so it'll show up. So we get a lot of customers at times that'll ask that question. They're like, I have started feeding and my iron and manganese went away in my finished water, um, but it didn't. It's just sequestered so it doesn't turn the hawk powder pillows the right color. So it looks like it's gone, but then when you do the, the more complicated method, it's still there. So good question. Okay, thanks, Darren. Another one did come in. How long can you sequester iron and manganese for in a distribution system? So like I talked about earlier, it's really how long does the, the are you going to have the water in the distribution system? So ideally, when we're trying to sequester iron and manganese, um, we'd like for the water to turn over in the distribution system within three to five days. So after the water leaves the plant, as it travels through the distribution system, the faster you turn it over, the more iron and manganese is going to stay sequestered, and you're not going to see any color complaints. You're not going to see anything uh, drop out. Um, as you start to stretch to seven days or 10 days or longer, you'll tend to see some drop out of the metal. So when you go and measure it at those far distribution points and measure iron and manganese, you might see that if you had a part of iron leaving the plant that was sequestered and you get to the far points, we might be down to 0.8 milligrams per liter because we did lose some iron over time. So just something to keep in mind. We want to try to move that water as quickly through the system. Okay, thanks, Darren. And thank you everyone today for joining. That's it for today's webinar. Have a great day.